Hello and welcome to the final day of the Building Bridges Conference, organised by Nottingham Trent University's Postcolonial Studies Centre in Bonington Gallery. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bethan Evans and I'm a final year PhD candidate in the School of Arts and Humanities at NTU. I will be chairing today's panel. Throughout the week, we have heard and taken part in powerful and illuminating conversations about decoloniality, intersectionality and neocolonialism. Professor Avtar Bra's keynote speech opened up discussions about how to think about decoloniality and intersectionality in the 21st century. And Dr. Sophie Chow's invited careful consideration of ecology, capitalism, anthropology and indigeneity. The resonances of both speeches have echoed throughout the conference. In our interest in building bridges, intersectionality and interdisciplinarity have been realised as fundamental instruments for conceiving of decoloniality and unsettling the violent legacy of colonialist action and imperialist ideology. The reality of colonialism persists in our educational, governmental, institutional and cultural structures, and the question of unsettlement is pertinent in all areas. We've also been alerted to the significance of incongruity, to the need to resist attempts at reconciliation and respect tensions and frictions for what they teach us about our world. We hope that this conference will ignite further consideration of how to build, unbuild and rebuild bridges. Today's panel focuses on narrative, storytelling and form, tools through which we read and interpret the world. We will firstly hear from Carolina Buffoli, whose paper is titled Decolonial Readings, Destabilising Eurocentric Frames of Interpretation in Contemporary of, uh, Indigenous Literature. The case of Alex, uh, Alexis Wright's Plains of Promise. Carolina is a PhD student and teacher of English literature at the University of Edinburgh. Her doctoral project addresses the comparative analysis of how contemporary postcolonial and Scottish writings engage with the Gothic discourse to confront the, legos the legacies of colonialism, foregrounding issues around narrative, cultural memory, silences and social shame. Such interests are strongly felt in her paper today, which considers the extent to which Wright's novel defamiliarises the Western reader through categorical and narrative irresolution. Next, we will hear from Marine Berthiel, paper, Decolonising Aotearoa New Zealand Young Adult Literature, The Case of Bugs by VT Araka. Marine is a third year PhD student in New Zealand literature at the University of Edinburgh. Her research deals with the representations of girlhood trauma in Aotearoa New Zealand literature written by women. Marine's today, uh, Marine today presents an example of such representation in Araka's novel. We will then hear Dr. Rachel Gregory Fox's paper, Hostile and Hospitable Environments in Ali Smith's Seasonal Quartet. Rachel is a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow at the University of Kent, whose research project focuses on migration, the UK's hostile environment and the ethics of storytelling. Her monograph will be published with Routledge this year. Rachel's paper considers storytelling as generative in the face of hostile UK environments. The final paper, Building Bridges Through Interdisciplinary Practice, Creating Inclusive and Shared Spaces Through Narrative Writing in a Distinctly Diverse Intercultural Communication Class, is presented by Dr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Yasmin Ryu. Yasmin received her PhD in English Composition and Applied Linguistics from Indiana University of Pennsylvania in 2017. Her primary research interests are e-composition, multilingual writing, narrative, environmental writing, interdisciplinary writing and multi-genre work. Yasmin speaks to us today about her experience implementing narrative as a tool for learning in her intercultural communication class. Please note that this event includes live automated closed captioning and that this may include some mistakes. Uh, please join me now in listening to our panellists. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Carolina Buffo, a PhD candidate in English Literature at the University of Edinburgh and I'm delighted to participate in the Building Bridges Conference. Today we'll be talking about decolonial readings, destabilizing Eurocentric frames of interpretation in contemporary criticism of Indigenous literature, and I will be focusing primarily on the case of Lexus Wright's Plains of Promise. My uh, intervention addresses the tendency in contemporary literary and scholarly criticism uh, of making Indigenous voices digestible to Western mainstream leadership by absorbing them into Eurocentric explanatory models. Since the 1990s, a critical shift towards reading literature in relation to both the global and the local has emerged, a tendency to read literature in relation to the notion of world literatures. This created new audiences for Indigenous writing, additional ways of understanding it, as well as new reading challenges and problematic reception 
of these texts. In my research, I investigate contemporary indigenous writing in dialogue with contemporary Scottish literature. In exploring the existing scholarship of these texts, it emerges how pervasively criticism adopts Eurocentric theoretical categories and explanatory models as strategies to fix indigenous narratives, especially when indigenous writing decidedly turns away from Western realism. A good example of this is um, Plains of Promise, a novel by the Aboriginal writer and land rights activist Alexis Wright. Published in 1997, the novel is deeply anchored in Aboriginal experiences, concerned with contested land, and written during the National Inquiry into the Stolen Generations to, ex to explore this blind spot in Australian history. Issues of land, disconnection, and transgenerational trauma are mapped out onto the novel's engagement with the supernatural and the uncanny. Plains of Promise is inhabited by different haunting elements, spirits of the dead and spirits to heal and satisfy to restore harmony, a natural world alive with the spirits of the land, ubiquitous crows, there are simultaneously death omens, unsettling presences and comforting onlookers, eyes watching ivy, the protagonist of the text in her dreams, whispering grasses, rocks, trees, hills and rivers resonating with the creed with the creaks and moans of the great spirits awakening, creatures and visions perceived by characters in moments of crisis and spirits that haunt the night in Aboriginal places, evil spirits crawling like a snake, sneaking around until they find someone to take away, Kalisha men as well as evil spirits originated by dispossession, and ghosts reminiscent of settler Gothic narratives, such as a deceased husband returning as a niggling terrier looking for his aged wife, a ghost story of revenge and retribution, and the legend of the ghost car that suddenly appears and fades away as you're driving along Gulf Country roads at night. This, the novel evokes, is scary country at night. You must keep going, just in case. This miscellaneous spiritual realm has multiple and often deliberately ambiguous origins and generates a hybrid spectralization of the land and of the novel more broadly. Wright's first novel undoubtedly poses significant interpretive challenges. That's why I believe the existing scholarship on Plains of Promise is a helpful case study to reflect on the metacritical issue at the core of my analysis. Revealing, in fact, the critics that have engaged with the novel often refer back to ways of reading and interpreting its supernatural dimension that make it accessible to mainstream readers by explaining it, by rationalizing it through explanatory modes that are known and long established, primarily that of the Gothic and of magical realism. Much of the existing scholarship absorbs the novel into different inflections or subcategories of the Gothic. For example, Catherine Bartha speaks of the post-colonial Gothic novel Plains of Promise, reading it as post-colonial Gothic because it casts nature synonymous with the known human as uncanny. Kral contends that the Gothic seems to originate in the post-colonial experience from which it emanates, claiming that Alexis Wright's first novel seems almost naturally Gothic, as if there was a certain Gothicism inherent in the post-colonial experience, without clarifying this further. Another set of critics have been celebrating uh, debating the inclusion of Plains of Promise in the category of magical realism. Confronted by the strangeness and inaccessibility of Wright's novel with its conflation of miraculous and mundane, Carolyn Bliss deploys the category of magical realism in the attempt to clarify our vision. Similarly, another critic that entails, um, that engages in this, in this um, framework is Marietta Colander, also, who also labels Plains of Promise rather straightforwardly as undoubtedly a magical realist text of post-colonial consequence. The evocation and jumble in her reading of trauma theorists, myth, gothic and, and psychoanalytic interpretation in parallel with the magical realist reading results confusing and becomes problematic as well as Eurocentric when it leads the scholar to readily interpret the unsettling visions of an Aboriginal character as a psychological metaphor for the character's ordeal. The nervousness, the hesitation, but still the need to ascribe the book to a specific category strongly merge in the interpretive attempt of Wright's text. The existing criticism of the novel frequently deploys Western interpretive paradigms to make sense of a narrative that intentionally upsets those very categorizing models. Additionally, absorbing indigenous narratives into Western schemes of interpretation risks perpetrating the appropriation of indigenous knowledge and worldview to benefit non-indigenous minds, exposing the intention not just to understand, but ultimately to incorporate a manifestly other world. <laughs> 
Mainstream readers are able to place that which is foreign or inscrutable to them within Western traditions that relate to forms of knowing and dominant forms of epistemological framework which have been globalized within which readers are positioned. Frequently, the scholar interpretations of indigenous writing are also fundamentally built on the binary system, realism versus magic, supernatural, the, the for reinforcing and perpetrating colonial ideas of reasonable Western realism versus pre-colonial indigenous uh, irrationality. My intervention, therefore, foregrounds a critique of the internalization of Eurocentric theoretical categories, confronting how to investigate any global text, knowing that categories and framing are so deeply Eurocentric. This epistemic violence is a controversial and much debated problem Spivak addresses in her seminal essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? Discussing the problem of the permission to narrate, Said also explored. Spivak posits the knowledge of the other subject as theoretically impossible. The subaltern, Spivak suggests, can only be spoken for and spoken of by a narrative that will always be subordinated to Eurocentric framework. Essentially, Spivak postulates the possibility that the intellectual is complicit in the persistent constitution of the other. As a white European critic coming to indigenous texts, I'm not just interested in what these narratives are doing, but also in the role and function of criticism, as well as in how my interventions can effect effectively unsettle the complicity of violence implicit in the incorporation of indigenous writing into Western schemes of interpretation. The use of Western genre categorizations appears as a strategy to absorb the novel's engagement with the supernatural within long established forms, the Gothic and magical realism known to mainstream readership, thus providing a sheer code of textual accessibility. The risk embedded in these efforts to make the text unambiguous is that of assimilating it into eurocentric expository models overlooking and or failing to understand what Plains of Promise ultimately is making clear, the impossibility of explaining this narrative with a Western rational. This, I argue, is the foremost inflection of the uncanny in the novel for Western readership. My investigation of Plains of Promise suggests, in fact, an alternative way of reading the text that avoids pigeonholing it in a Western genre categorization while not abstaining from the attempt of interpreting the narrative by exploring the significance of its engagement with the Gothic. In fact, my reading of Plains of Promise contends that the novel is doing something more than just reanimating the traumas of the past through the supernatural or writing back to the Gothic as an imperial form, as the critics engaging with the text have suggested. Through its engagement with the supernatural, specifically with the Gothic, the novel consciously re-inhabits Eurocentric and Western discourses while deliberately positioning itself in an other epistemology. Plains of Promise deliberately elicits and challenges Gothic interpretations, destabilizing the non-Indigenous reader who can almost make sense of the narrative through this long-established genre, but not quite. I use the term uncanny self-consciously in this context to indicate the psychological discomfort, the estrangement the mainstream readership experience, the disturbing sensation of engaging with the strangely familiar. Eluding known parameters of explanation for the supernatural while simultaneously evoking them, the text defamiliarizes the non-Indigenous reader, presenting us with the limits of Western schemes of interpretation, while stating that the Indigenous worldview and experience, though different, are as real and valid as Western ones. A good example of this in the novel is the Aboriginals' response to the abuses they suffer in the mission where they are relocated after being displaced from their traditional homeland. The mother of the novel's main character is a voiceless and nameless figure in the text, identified by the mission authorities as number 976805, a lost number among the lost and condemned. When the missionaries take her daughter Ivy from her so that the badness of the black of black skin wouldn't rub off, the woman is overcome by grief and is eventually locked up in the black hole, a place for troublesome blacks, a prison cell of 180 by 300 centimetres where the mission authorities aim at frightening her into passivity. There, the woman is haunted by visions of small, faceless men visiting her in the blackness of the night, pulling at her skin, trying to rip her apart, taunting her as she tried to escape, pulling and jabbing her skin wherever they could with her sharp nails. She's also tormented by the unrelenting attack of a blackbird pecking her incessantly. 
The novel does not solve the tension between a psychoanalytic explanation of atonements, reading these visitations as delusions produced by the woman's desperation, the return of her trauma preying on her mind, and a supernatural explanation. In fact, old Modi, an Aboriginal woman old as the land, witnesses the suffering of Abby's mother. She hears the flapping of the bird's wing and finds the terrified, incoherent victim bleeding and shaking, huddled on the ground. Understanding the wounds on the woman's body as material evidence of the supernatural dimension of these visitations, old Modi tells Reverend Jip, the white mission leader. The Reverend, however, refuses to believe her knowledge and the woman's assault. He will not be deluded. The narrative, therefore, consistently presents the reader with the two ambivalent perceptions and their essential incommensurability, generating a structure in tension deliberately unresolved or unsett and unsettling. The novel, I suggest, works precisely in the productive gaps engendered by its unresolvedness, in the tension between and negotiation of the two ontological and epistemological systems, the indigenous and the non-indigenous. The reader, as much as the characters, are required to acknowledge that there are things that the other knows that we cannot. Deliberately estranging the reader, Plains of Promise reclaims the validity of an Aboriginal worldview within the Western form of the novel, self-consciously engaging with Western paradigms to unsettle them. A defamiliarized home for the reader, Plains of Promise positions us in a simulator of the Aboriginal experience. The unsettledness of being in place and out of place simultaneously, of inhabiting a context where the familiar is becoming strange. This destabilizing predicament is also the settler's experience of making a home in an unfamiliar land, heimlich, inasmuch as it was an extension of the familiar motherland, yet simultaneously, inherently, other. In Uncanny Australia, Gelder and Jacobs identify this tension and combination of the familiar and the unfamiliar, the way that one seems always to inhabit the other, as relevant to, although by no means specific to, postcolonial Australia, a nation that becomes unfamiliar to itself precisely because of the postcolonial condition in which an indigenous population is increasingly able not just to write back, but to produce a wide range of special effects which can be unsettling right across the board. Ultimately, as Renee suggests, that despite appearances, no one may claim to be completely at home or in place in the post-colonial nation is at the core of Plains of Promise. Plains of Promise is a novel that refuses submission to the tragedies of colonialism. By engaging with the Gothic and with Western paradigms, the narrative consciously dislocates ready interpretations that essentially aim at disambiguation and reclaims the power of unsettling hybridity in an act of creative resistance. Thank you for your attention. I'm really interested in hearing your comments and observations on this. Um, I leave here my contact details in case you, you wish to discuss this further. Thank you again. Today, the title of my paper is Decolonizing Aotearoa New Zealand Young Adult Literature, The Case of Bugs by Fitieri Aka. Aotearoa New Zealand literature is often criticized for being the realm of male authors of Pakeha descent, that is to say New Zealanders of British descent, which limits the literary representativity of women and girls in general and of ethnic minorities in particular, especially in non-fiction genres and children's literature. Titi Reaka, Ngati Tufaretoa, Te Arawa, Ngati Fakaue, Tu Haurengi, Pakeha, is an award-winning author whose novels, Bugs and Legacy, respectively received the 2013 New Zealand Book Honour Award and the 2019 New Zealand Book Award for Young Adult Fiction. Bugs can be read as a crossover text as its targeted audience is aged between 15 and 30, and as it questions the intercultural relationships between Maori and Pakeha in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Readers are indeed invited to follow teenage Maori and Thai heroine during a last year of high school. They can then experience racial, sexist, and classist discrimination through her point of view. In this context, I intend to answer the following question. To what extent does Fitieriaka decolonize Aotearoa New Zealand young adult literature in Bergs? 
First, I will study Bugs as the coming-of-age story of a 16-year-old Maori high school girl from the center of the North Island. Then I will focus on Ereaka's construction of a dual address to her readers. And finally, I will analyze the way Maori and Pakeha literary traditions intermingle in the text to entice teenagers to build a fairer society in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Part one. Bugs is a 16-year-old Maori high school girl who is the only child of a single mother from the lower class. Despite being at the intersection of several subjugating factors such as gender, ethnicity, class, age and family situation, Bugs is a brilliant student. Her eponymous novel can be read as a female Bildungsroman constructing her as a relational being as she develops alongside her fanau, which means extended family in Te Reo Māori, composed of her mother, grandparents, uncle and two best friends, Jez, a Māori boy from a deprived social background and Charmaine, better known as Coldstone, a Pakeha girl from the upper class. At high school, Bugs is aware that all her teachers are Pakea and that they regard Māori students as enemies, Chapter 2. Schooling is therefore described as a discriminating microcosm which systematically fails Māori students. Mere Skerret similarly contests the New Zealand school system as statistics reveal that Māori children are left behind in their own land, which reenacts colonial stereotypes. Jenny Lee Morgan also explains that schooling segregation is based on the stereotype of Māori as school leavers and as difficult and failing students. In this context, Bergs feels like an oddity as she does not fit racialized expectations of her academic abilities. In chapter two, Bergs compares the dystopia she is living, in which New Zealand society systematically debases Māori, to George Orwell's novel 1984. Berg's interpretation of New Zealand as an authoritarian state for its indigenous people stems from the fact that the education system participates in the destruction of its Maori students as it implements a British inspired school model, which too often excludes Maori educational practices. The anti heroine also learns to navigate other forms of segregation around her, especially residential segregation. Despite being friend with a Pakeha girl, Bugs is perceived as an outsider in the upper class district where her friend lives. In chapter 12, she thinks, I pick up my pace, but try to keep it as a fast walk. A 16-year-old Mari running in this neighborhood? Probably not up for a job. Why make the cops pick me up here? Bugs is aware that for Pakeha residing in this privileged area, she looks like a thief. Her ethnicity, age and social class intersect against her, criminalizing her in the eyes of rich white adults. Even if the segregation era ended in the 1960s in New Zealand, remnants of this practice can still be found connecting the Pakeha ethnicity with power and wealth. Part 2 as a crossover text, Bugs deals with sensitive topics like drugs, domestic violence, racism, sexism, and suicide, which are often labeled as adult contents, even if children can experience them very early in their lives. In the teacher's notes provided by the Huya Press, the publisher of Bugs and a specialist of indigenous literatures in Aotearoa, Margaret Cahill argues that Iriaka's novel is, I quote, appropriate for students of at least 15 years of age. The violence that pervades the teenagers' lives is perceived as dangerous and damaging for young readers. Giving teenagers access to an abusive universe, even if it is fictional, has the potential to traumatize young minds vicariously, as well as re-traumatize survivors. Hence the publisher's warning. Yet, as Janet Alsop notes, vicarious trauma, experiencing trauma through somebody else's first-hand account, can help young adult readers grow up as they identify with a resilient fictional character. Readers can change through vicarious experience, she writes. They can grow, develop, ask new questions, think new thoughts, and even feel new emotions. 
Total engagement in a narrative world is powerful and can create internal personal narratives of self that, some argue, might guide a reader's behavior in the future. If we focus on its themes, Bugs is addressed to both teenagers and adults. Fiti Ariaka also writes for a bicultural readership. A dual address to both Marie and Pakeha young readers situates her text at the crossroad where the main cultures of Aotearoa can meet. In Reading Indigeneity, the Ethics of Interpretation and Representation, Claire Bradford argues that Indigenous fiction always implies two audiences, Indigenous children, for whom the world of the text may offer a sense of narrative subjectivity, and non-Indigenous children who are, in Linton's terms, cultural outsiders. Ereaka focalizes her text on Berg's point of view, giving readers insight into her thought process. By doing so, she participates in the decolonization of New Zealand YA fiction, which for too long relegated Maori characters in the background and portrayed them in a stereotypical way. She also highlights the lack of identification Maori teenagers experience when forced to read texts whose heroes are teenage Pakeha or white Americans. For example, Bugs mocks her English teacher's choice of texts for her class mostly composed of Maori students. Like half of us can relate to a white chick with a thing for dogs and dead Jews, chapter two. Compelled to read a vampire story for her assignment, Bugs yet refuses to identify to a white heroine. The mirror effect expected by the Pakeha teacher is a deformed reflection, because if Bugs agrees with mimicking Pakeha, she would end up as a mere mimic girl, and why fiction would be used as a colonizing tool in Aotearoa. Many critics like Fiona McCullough and Lucy Andrew have noted the power of children's literature in polishing and controlling children's behaviours. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, Janice Frigard found that 91% of all fiction published in 2015 had been written by Pakeha authors, regardless of their gender, whereas only 3.4% had been written by Maori writers. In this context, Eriaka's choice of indigenizing YA fiction gives visibility to the institutional racism young Maori face in their everyday life. Part three, Eriaka's literary references stem from both Maori and Pakeha traditions. She contests the fairy tale myths propagated by American cartoons, especially since they aim at polishing white girls as innocent and frail. When Burks witnesses Goldstone's attempt at committing suicide, she realizes that Pakeha girls from the middle class are also at risk of suicide because of patriarchal expectations based on their gender, class and ethnicity. Lee Gilmore calls this ideology which constrains white girls' thoughts and movements, gender pessimism. In chapter 12, we can read... All those princesses and fairy tales waiting in a tower, waiting in a glass coffin, waiting to be kissed like their lives mean nothing without a prince. This is what we are feared. This is what we are supposed to aspire to. It's not my life. It's not hers. It's bullshit. Burke's feminist reading of gender expectations shows her rejection of an important model of subjugated femininity. The mainstream discourses girls hear about themselves actually imprison them into an exploitative and self-demeaning life journey. Even Berg's own story could be read as a rewriting of Cinderella as she climbs the social ladder. Yet she realizes the irony of this reading when she highlights that her resemblance with this princess is limited due to her skin color. Instead of applying a ready-made Western storyline onto Berg's coming-of-age story, Ereaka introduces instead Maori oral literature via the mythic figure of Maui. Jez experiences a series of subjugating factors such as domestic violence, homelessness, cooling issues, poverty, drug consumption and racism. Berg's green mother gives him an alternative life narrative when she connects his family name, Muka, to Maui's exploits. Is the stuff in flags, 
If you peel away the outside, it's what's inside. They use it for weaving because it's strong. It binds things together. It's what Maui's robes were made of when he fished up the North Island and when he tamed the sun, chapter eight. Rita Baker explains that muka can be found in different types of flax, such as harakeke. Harakeke's hard exterior can be cut, then peeled by a mussel shell to extract the flexible muka which is inside. Female weavers split the raw muka in halves, then cross the two halves before rolling them together to transform it into a rope. Muka is an essential element in the art of Maori weaving, and it has a mythical aura due to its mentioning in Maori stories. By telling him the origin story of his name, Berg's grandmother connects Jesus to his past and to his present as a cultural agent in contemporary Aotearoa. Jess subsequently leaves their country town for Auckland to work as a tattoo artist. Mari storytelling therefore saves Jess from committing suicide, giving him back a meaning and a role within his community. However, Bugs eventually refuses to follow her friend's escape from traumatic and dystopian tales. She instead decides to fight discriminations from within, pursuing her own academic path to enter law school. Her dream is to become a lawyer like Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Berg sacrifices herself for the well-being of her community, giving her talent and time to redistribute justice in Aotearoa. The literary figure of Atticus Finch is symbolic as he fought against segregation in the United States, even if he was white himself. In choosing this literary monument from American literature, Ereaka invites her Pakeha young readers to defend Maori rights too and put an end to discriminatory practices perpetrated by New Zealand as a settler colony. To conclude, I can say that Fiti Ereaka decolonizes Aotearoa New Zealand YA fiction by focalizing her narrative on the Maori teenage girl's internal thought process, showing young adult readers the impact discriminations have on her lifestyle and mental health. Janet Isop knows that exposure to certain female images affects young girls' conceptions of what they can be. In the case of Bugs, Maori girl readers realize that they have a choice. They can either follow a colonizing Western conception of girls as princesses and let themselves be directed by men's decisions, or they can resist the Pakeha-led government's discouraging discourse on Maori students and decolonize the system from within, like Bergs, who chooses to become a lawyer to defend Maori people with Maori laws. Fiti Ereaka's ending is therefore optimistic for Maori girl readers as it encourages them to defy gender and ethnic expectations existing in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Thank you so much for your attention. With Autumn, the first instalment of Alice Smith's seasonal quartet arriving on the heels of the EU referendum in 2016, Smith firmly situates her series of network novels within the present political moment in the UK. This paper considers how Smith's quartet, Autumn, Winter, Spring and Summer, published between 2016 and 2020, responds to the UK's hostile environment, which becomes intricately intertwined with the everyday lives of the book's disparate cast of characters. More specifically, I seek to address how Smith narrativizes and challenges notions of othering and exclusion, and in particular, how these pertain to the topic of migration. In doing so, I trace some of the hostile and hospitable environments that emerge over the course of this literary quartet. In his discussion of summer and the narrative threads, characters and relationships that surface and resurface throughout these network novels, Ivan Kalos describes how Smith's writing manifests a principle and ethic of connection. It is this notion, of the ethic of connection, that this paper draws from, thinking about our connections to the past and present, our connections to each other, and the connections that we can discover through creative interaction. Written in the midst of the hostile environment, 
Smith's seasonal quartet charges us to consider what possible futures might lie around the corner, if only we can learn to be more hospitable. In its application of an ethics of reading and writing, this paper argues that the act of storytelling is ultimately generative and has the capacity to extend a gesture of welcome. As one of the characters in Springs suggests, there's ways to survive these times, and I think one way is the shape the telling takes. Autumn, the first of Smith's literary quartet, has, in many of its reviews, been ascribed as a post-Brexit novel, or what Christian Shaw coins as Brexit, a body of literature that responds either directly or imaginatively to Britain's exit from the EU. Yet, as Berta Heidemann warns, Brexit is anything but post. Even now, after the UK's formal departure from the EU, we are only beginning to see what those long-term political and economic impacts might be. Instead, Heidemann argues that autumn is not necessarily bound to a specific contemporary event, but rather diagnoses an innate yet imminent sense of emergency that, among others, might also read as the underlying cause for all things Brexit. I would go on to argue that autumn and its successes are then responsive, not to one particular incident, such as Brexit, but instead receptive to the political, cultural and ecological environments within which Smith writes. These environmental conditions might give rise to and emerge out of more specific events, such as the EU referendum in autumn or the COVID pandemic in summer. But Smith's interest lies in the intimate stories of her cast of characters. Smith is not preoccupied with flashpoints, but with the currents upon which the so-called unprecedented and unexpected are and have always been contingent. In what Heinemann recognises as a sense of emergency, there is also a discernible degree of hostility, which has ingratiated itself within several environments. Politically, hostility manifests by increasingly punitive anti-immigration policy and the implementing of further austerity measures. In the face of populist, populist, racist and xenophobic rhetoric in both political and public discourse, cultural institutions and communities of all kinds find themselves under attack and or divided and fractured. And while on the ecological front, effective responses to the climate crisis are hindered by climate denial and industries that are pioneered under neoliberal capitalism and ecological endeavor. Smith's literary quartet mediates on these various hostile environments across temporal and spatial lines, as symbolized by the changing of the seasons. For this paper, I focus specifically on the hostile environment as it pertains to the topic of migration, but in tracing both hostile and hospitable paradigms as they are presented by Smith, the sense of emergency that's captured in her work continues to be framed by these contexts that I've just highlighted. Lindsay Stonebridge argues that for literary ethics to amount to something more than literary humanism is to reckon with political and moral judgment. Um, so how can a work of art or a piece of writing affect an ethics with the potential for political change? Smith's quartet is in many ways a defense and a celebration of art. As a particular example of this, we might read Autumn as in part an ode to 1960s pop artist Pauline Boaty. When Elizabeth as a young girl is out walking with her elderly neighbor, Daniel, he proposes a game called Every Story Tells a Picture. The game Daniel tells us is one where he describes a collage and you can tell me what you think of it. Without actually seeing it, Elizabeth asks, by seeing it in the imagination, Daniel tells her. Both the younger Elizabeth and the reader of Smith's novel um, are invited to imagine one of Bote's collages. This rendition of visual art and written language is a story that tells a picture. Following Daniel's description of the collage, Elizabeth comments, I like that you could maybe touch the pink if it was made of lace. I mean, it would feel different from the blue. This exchange indicates that the remembering, the storying, the celebration of art is not only an act of recounting, but also one of responding, analytically, emotionally, and affectively. That the image in Elizabeth's mind eye affects the sense of touch, shows the capacities of this imaginative engagement. 
And in thinking about this exchange, we can see truth to Hannah Arendt's argument that the immediate source of the artwork is the human capacity for thought. Arendt contends that the material of poetry is language, which is the closest materialization of thought. Art and the act of storytelling is a means of conveying thought and feeling. But word alone is not enough. It is, as Arendt puts it, with word and deed that we insert ourselves into the human world. The relationship between speaking and acting is intricately bound. Speaking is a means of acting, of engaging with people in the material and political world. As Arendt suggests that the poet has the task of setting this process of narration in motion and of involving us in it, she conveys how the action of narration is collaborative. Narration is a means of being in the world, of reconciling with what we experience and with what we think and feel about it. We humanize what is going on in the world and in ourselves only by speaking it, um, she argues. And in the course of speaking of it, we learn to be human. Narrative, which materializes the world and our manner of being in it, and the exchanging of stories evokes the potentials of human action in the present and in the future. And it's my argument that such a vision of narration as it appears in Arendt's work is realized in Smith's seasonal quartet that her writing captures the complex thoughts and feelings that circulate in response to present day emergencies and that such writing might prompt meaningful and or ethical action both now and in the future. In thinking in particular of how the quartet mediates hostile environments, we can turn to a specific example from Winter. In the course of the narrative, Winter offers up a snapshot where, in balmy April, two huge sky transvision screens on the King's Cross Station concourse gives a 20-second news roundup. The major headlines read that there are now 80% more plastic in the Earth seas than estimated, that there's an attack taking place on MPs by MPs of the same party, and that a poll has found that citizens of this country oppose a unilateral guarantee for the citizens who live here and who are originally from a lot of other countries, to be able to stay here. These headlines point to the various hostile environments encapsulated in Smith's novels, the ecological, political, and cultural. Smith sums them up thusly, panic, attack, exclude. And yet this vision of hostile environment is not yet complete. To the triad panic, attack, exclude, Smith adds ignore, telling the reader that the news part is over, and next on the screen is an advert for a soft drink, an image of happy looking people drinking it. A hostile ex environment exists not simply due to fear, aggression and exclusion, but also in the ways that these sentiments become commonplace, to the point that we willfully ignore them. We become so switched off um, to the repetitiveness of these kinds of stories that we stop taking notice, or perhaps we find ourselves feeling so anxious, upset, are useless in the face of these events that we try to put them out of our minds to try and get on with our everyday lives. But as Smith cycles through to spring and summer, the characters find that such hostilities and anxieties are beginning to intrude into even the most ordinary of lives and mundane of moments. In other parts of Smith's quartet, a hostile environment, as it is conceived politically, is made more explicit. This is certainly the case in Spring, which is set in part at an immigration removal centre. Through the character of Brittany Hall, shortened to Brit, who is a detention custodial officer, we have painted a picture of how an IRC operates from within. The centre can easily be described as a heterotopia, and it operates with its own language, both bureaucratical and derogatory. In one breath, Brit tells us, I'm a DCO at one of the IRCs employed by the private security firm SA4A, who on behalf of the HO run the spring, the field, the work, and so on. The acronyms operate almost as a code, setting the world of detention policy and practice outside of the realm of the layman. Amongst the bureaucracy, Brit also calls the detainees DEETS, a word her colleague describes as akin to insect repellent. You can get really sick, it's a neurotoxin under your skin going right into you, he says. The invasive language used here recalls all too familiar media and political coverage, which has variously described migrants as swarms, as cockroaches and as invaders. 
As the narrative of spring progresses, Brit finds herself following the character of Florence, a schoolgirl with an ethereal kind of supernatural air to her. And she follows her to Scotland where she meets Alda Lyons, a librarian and coffee truck driver, and Richard Lees, an aging filmmaker. Alda, it conspires, belongs to a network of volunteers who help detainees escape, disappearing people from a system that has already disappeared to them. This unlikely group of people share the space of the coffee truck, another heterotopia. But whereas the detention centre represents a hostile environment, I would contend that the truck poses a hospitable one. What connections might be formed by placing these four very different people, a librarian, a schoolgirl, a security guard and a filmmaker in the same space? What stories might be exchanged? And with these questions in mind, I turn now to the character of Richard, who builds from this meeting a, me a film project that engages with the work of Alda Lyons Network in aid of detainees. Interviewing Alda, Richard comments that what you're doing is not feasible in any real world scenario. And in response, Alda replies, it's human, there's no scenario more real. This dialogue recalls Arendt's own arguments that we humanize what is going on in the world. The world is a human space. Our words and actions build the environments that we inhabit and move through. In seeking hospitality, we seek connection to the places and the people and the objects that cross our paths. Smith's quartet, as Callas describes it, embodies a singular ascetic of connection. In drawing this paper to a close, I turn finally, and in the interest of time very briefly, to summer. Set during the very early months of the COVID pandemic, the central narratives of the novel are interspersed with a series of letters written by teenager Sasha Greenlaw to a detention detainee that she addresses as hero. These letters are a small but important instant in which words and action come together a means of making a connection, an exchange of stories, a gesture of hospitality. At the close of the novel, Hero responds with his own letter and writes, thank you for imagining my life. Thank you for allowing me to imagine your life. With this act of writing and exchanging stories, Smith encapsulates the importance that narrative has in the process of making human. Inhabiting hostile environments in states of panic, attack and exclusion, it can feel necessary for our sanity and for our protection to close the blinds and flee what is happening around us. And this is not an inherently bad thing. Preservation is a perfectly natural instinct. But we might take heed of Arendt's argument that flight from the world in dark times of impotence can always be justified as long as reality is not ignored, but is constantly acknowledged as the thing that must be escaped. In a hostile environment composed of large-scale political schemes, structural violence and ecological disaster, acts of protest or calls for change might seem futile. But Arendt poses that um, here, and Smith does this in her literary quartet, that through the act of narration we might affect change. This change might exist as nothing more than a simple acknowledgement, an exchange of letters. But by acknowledging the world and our place in that world, we extend a hand, an act of hospitality with the capacity to bring about something new. And in closing, I want to gesture ever so briefly to Companion Piece, the fifth book of the quartet that's scheduled to come out on the 7th of April, same day that this paper is set to be presented in its recorded form. I'm in no position to comment on the book's content or how it might contribute to the ethos and ethic of connection that Smith strives for in her quartet. But as the publisher website describes it as a celebration of companionship, I would be interested to see how this latest instalment might trace out hospitable pathways. Thank you very much for listening. Hi everyone, um, welcome to my presentation. I am Yasmin Rio and I'm located in, in the USA. I teach at Divine Word College. Um, welcome to my presentation, Building Bridges Through Interdisciplinary Practice, Creating Inclusive and Shared Places Through Narrative Writing in a Distinctly Diverse Intercultural Communication Course. Um, so before I begin to dive into the actual content here, I wanted to point out why I even got interested in this topic. 
So I was teaching an intercultural communication class to in a very unique setting. 98% of our students are international, and my course was completely made up of international students. So one could assume that, oh, they have so much experience with intercultural life. Um, intercultural communication should be a breeze for everyone. However, I noticed that that was not the case. Students struggle to understand the theoretical framework that was oftentimes surround concepts within this discipline. And so I noticed that they were struggling to make sense of these methodologies and abstract side of intercultural communication and didn't really recognize how this made sense in reality. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to implement narrative writing um, in my class in order to provide my international students with a shared place where meaning making could take place in a collective way and where stories became central to such a common space. So I wanted them to, by writing, give them an opportunity to write themselves into our new course situation. To provide my international students with a physical and symbolic location where they were encouraged to examine questions of identity while combining prior knowledge with content knowledge to encourage my class to share and foreground their prior experiences and to move their ways of knowing from the peripheral to the center of our place where meeting making took place collectively. So I wanted to give them kind of like a medium in which to connect what is being taught, knowledge in the class, with their, with their, prior, with their previous life, with their prior knowledge. So I found that narrative writing was an excellent conduit of combining the two to reflect on, hey, what have I done that would make sense with what is being taught? So acquire content knowledge by reflecting on prior knowledge. So just kind of to um, discuss um, the objectives, um, writing is a mode of inquiry. And it offers writers a channel for reflection on new information, content information, and related material, and to explore their own responses to these items and to relate to the subject matter on a personal level. They realize individual reflections and perceptions that can then be expressed through self-produced texts. So this is empowering in itself because then the students are able to produce texts by writing. Um, and notice that, oh, I'm examining what I am being taught in this content knowledge, and it absolutely makes sense to me. Um, because oftentimes the, the act of writing itself helps us grapple with relatively complex questions or subjects or topics or fields. So that is one of the reasons I, I use this as well, because just writing it out oftentimes helps one reflect and examine, and then paraphrasing, of course, forces one to, to really have to deal with something and so and then having to rephrase it that reflects one's own knowledge. So with my goal that narrative writing could engage students and foster their recognition of the students discoursal selves, allow my international students, which is the entire class, to grapple with their multilingual, multifaceted and geographical and interdisciplinary identities through the act of writing in a shared place. So our physical location of this course, of this classroom essentially, but also the more symbolic um, sphere of the course itself uh, that emphasized inclusion and equality. By asking students to combine prior knowledge with content knowledge, they were given the opportunity to develop the authority to identify themselves as the author of their text. And here I'm qu quoting Park, two, 2013, page 339, which is empowering and conducive to establishing a sense of belonging. Because that, of course, is really important um, for international students is that they feel like they belong, despite the fact that they're in a totally new sphere. And oftentimes they're there all alone. Objectives of the study then further were to examine how writing enables students to reflect on and exchange prior knowledge and individual experiences to navigate their highly complex meanings and concepts of self in varying physical and symbolic spaces, to examine how an intercultural communication class can act as a temporal contact zone where international students create individual voices that empower them by combining past experiences and prior knowledge with experiences created here and now. So again, using writing as a way to combine what is right here right now with the experiences that are just as valid, of course, and the prior knowledge to make sense on a more personal um, manner, I guess. To examine how narrative writing as performative action acts as identity inquiry for international students, as identities always under construction, of course, and in my current case, 
It's complicated by the spatial dislocation of the students because, like I said, they were oftentimes here by themselves because they're international students. Um, and these students, because of the unique environment in which I teach, they're not just here for a semester. Most of the time, they're here for like six years, um, oftentimes without having the opportunity to return home within that time frame. So just discussing the study context briefly, I teach at a college in Midwestern USA. It's a liberal art um, seminary, 98% um, international students. So it's linguistically, geographically, extremely diverse. So very unique, very amazing, very awesome. <laughs> I really enjoy te teaching here and being surrounded by my students. Um, intercultural communication class, like I mentioned. Um, and my approach to this was interdisciplinary in nature because I'm teaching narrative writing, which is, of course, composition, but I'm also teaching comp or communication. So it kind of combines two frameworks, you know, two, two areas of study, really, um, to come up with an interdisciplinary framework in order to maximize the student's learning, of course, and to empower them by recognizing that what they come to class with, they're already equipped to know this stuff because they are so enriched with their own experiences. So here are just the writing prompts I used throughout the course. Um, as you can see, I, I, we skipped some chapters, obviously, because it's only 16 weeks long. It was a very big book. But here you can see, these were the course writing prompts. OK, so just a brief chapter 1, or 2, or 3, 4, 5, four, three, four 10, and 11. Um, and then I also supplemented that with some metacognitive prompts. So then I wanted the students, like in between chapter three and four, for example, I wanted the students to not only reflect on the content, like nonverbal communication, but I wanted them to reflect on, hey, how has this writing itself helped you? Has it helped you? So those are then supplemented by these metacognitive prompts. My findings, which were fantastic, um, it was very apparent that my students wrote very confidently and with great detail about their own experiences and that the act of writing enabled them to reflect on their own knowledge, which was then very empowering. So they were really able to, to recognize that this content knowledge, which was oftentimes very complex, um, that, it, that they knew all about it because they had experienced it most of the time, that they had something already in their life that was conducive to their understanding of the given topic. Um, several students writers noted that the narratives allowed them to re-engage with and ponder their past experiences in a new way because the course offered them a new framework from which to examine their life, essentially. Um, student writing interactions and activities yielded very authentic and insightful reflections that reflected that the students grappled with their thoughts and questions concerning themselves and the course. So it was clear that they really looked in themselves, but also were here within our shared space. All students seemed to eventually recognize that they had entered the class already equipped with vulnerable contributions, experiences, and knowledge, which was very empowering to everyone. So a successful re-examination took place of their past self and current self with the new spatial, geographic, and linguistic context. So like I said, it was very important for me to make sure that the students placed themselves into their new space. And it seemed that this narrative writing effectively did so. So here are my students' words. And I just highlighted a couple. I'm not going to read all of these. There are quite a few. But I just bolded some of them so you can just kind of glance at them quick. Um, some that stood out, it's necessary to know about myself to connect with others. That's very insightful. Um, the class itself, so these were more about the class, more open in a different way of living and interacting with others. Um, I came to know more about how culture influences one's identity. Reflecting on my experience, I realized that who I am is determined by the culture I was born in. Um, all factors or my identity are found in my culture. Here's Again, a little bit more about the course itself. After being in this class for some months, I learned um, and acknowledged that some elements of intercultural communication are already part of my behavior, like recognizing, oh my gosh, this is already part of who I am. <laughs> um, and I have been involved in some crucial elements of intercultural communication unconsciously. But writing about it made them reflect on it. And they noticed, oh my gosh, I'm doing this already. <laughs> um, a process of connecting prior knowledge to current course content emerged throughout the course and semester and yielded a very sincere, empowering, and a reflective process for students that helped them to connect with their current context and prior experiences and knowledge. More student words. 
And this is a lot again, so please just take the time a little bit to look at these for a moment. I'm going to slow down so you can do that. Um, but it really was just so personal experiences are given and to have a voice. Narrative is very useful to me in a way of deepening my understanding of knowledge and the self. Excellent. Um, narratives help me to uh, reinforce my knowledge, help me to open my mind, and had a great effect on myself and my ministry. So this, again, is very personal to them because they recognize their own role within the course and the topic due to the narrative writing process. Um, also helped me recognize that what I've learned um, I already knew in my experience. How empowering is that? So that was wonderful as well. Um, students were able to use writing as a way to connect prior to knowledge to current knowledge. Students were able to connect with their idea of self and this new self in a new physical, geographic, academic, social, linguistic context and finding their voices in a new sphere is incredibly empowering to them. So here's a select bibliography. Please contact me if you have any further questions. I'm here to help answer, communicate in whatever way I can. Thanks for listening. Uh, thank you everyone for those wonderful presentations. Um, they were very thought provoking and I have some questions for each of you. Um, but I thought I'd start with a general question to everyone um, based on something that I thought resonated throughout the papers. Um, so my question is, in post-anti and decolonial contexts, it is sometimes argued that the urgency of the socio-political can take precedence over aesthetic elements such as genre, form and mode. I personally think that there is political significance to such elements, um, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on this matter, if you disagree with me, or what, if any kind, um, of powers, storytelling, form and aesthetics has in or for the socio-political. Um, I don't know who wants to... Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy to go first. Um, I completely agree with you, Beth. I think that this selection of specific genre, of specific form, uh, or even deciding to write a short story or a novel, that is a political choice in, in a sense. It, it, there is a reason behind that selection. And it's, I think it's part of the, of the text itself. So it's as relevant as the content really to think about and I'm thinking specifically about the Gothic because that's my my area of research but for a post-colonial writer to decide an indigenous post-colonial writer to decide to engage with that form and not necessarily to write within it but to engage with it well that's definitely a political decision so it does have that kind of dimension to me yes yeah absolutely yeah I agree completely it's kind of yeah it's political nuances to whether you subvert or engage with or resist yeah. or anything Thing. Yeah, I'm kind of there to be. Yeah, does anybody else have any thoughts on that? I think thinking, um, because so Caroline touches on genre and the kind of thinking about the gothic, but thinking about genre in terms of the choice of a type of text or like a novel or, or poetic form or something, thinking about audience in that context, I think is it kind of ties into that question of like who the material is for and who you're trying to engage with and kind of what what wider audiences might we reach through different kinds of storytelling and by putting experiences into words that can be packaged or marketed kind of conveniently and then equally thinking about what what doesn't make it onto the onto the publication stands like what is it what kind of the stories as our kind of like the institution of the university or the institution of kind of publishers or or kind of even bookshop retailers, kind of how do they limit what kinds of stories we are kind of spoken um, politically and otherwise? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing, that kind of idea of limitation. Like we so often think about publishing as that place that, that opens stories up, but actually, you know, what limits are being put on by, you know, bookstores or publishing or marketing or anything like that, or even the university. I think that's, yeah, really important as well. Yeah. yeah, I guess that in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, there's been um, an evolution in the past few decades in the sense that uh, some indigenous um, publishing, um, you know, houses have uh, developed like a Huya Press and Makaro Press and they are dedicated to publishing Maori authors and um, Pacifica uh, writers as well. So. Yeah, I guess it it allows writers from indigenous uh, origins to express themselves more freely 
then uh, with Pakeha, so um, I, I would say a European uh, New Zealander press. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. So you can kind of see this coming across in different places as well. Different. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. So that was my kind of um, yeah, the question that I kind of thought spoke to everything. Um, we do have a question um, from Rachel for Marine, um, which um, I've got written down here. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask it just for ease. Um, so Rachel's interested in the role of pedagogy um, in your talk. Um, you speak of reading as a practice related to learning. Uh, in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Paulo Freire argues that teachers and students, co-intent on reality, are both subjects, not only in the task of unveiling that reality and thereby coming to know it critically, but in the task of recreating that knowledge. Um, so Rachel wonders um, what you think about how teachers, parents um, might serve as gatekeepers to the stories that children and teenagers have access to in the, um, in the YA market. Well, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know if I will be able to answer it fully, but um, yeah, I guess that there are guidelines. Um, I mentioned uh, one of them, actually. Uh, the Huya Press mentioned that, um, you know, um, books should be read by uh, students uh, who are aged over 15, um, which was kind of a surprise for me because I mean, in France, we are not used to having guidelines for uh, children uh, when it comes to reading and um, not really. But I guess that the, in the Anglophone world, more uh, than in the Francophone world. Um, so I guess that, yes, parents and teachers can definitely be gatekeepers. But at the same time, it seems that it's not really um, working. Um, if I come back to the text that um, I, I talked about, um, teenagers will always be critical of, um, of what is advised, you know, and uh, so they, they will find their ways to, uh, to actually read what they need to read as well. So probably for, for that's why the, the market is more and more open-minded on adult topics when it comes to YA fiction mm -hmm. as well. So, yeah, thank you for that. Um, I have heard as well, I don't know about the um, kind of Francophone context, but in Britain, um, the YA market seems to be a little bit ahead of the adult market sometimes in terms of like political, social, cultural kind of issues. Um, I just think that's really interesting to think um, you know, maybe we could learn something from the kind of things that, that um, the young adult market is, is interested in reading as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have a question for Carolina from Trang. Um, she asks, uh, you mentioned that categories are deeply Eurocentric, um, but in yesterday's presentation, um, somebody discussed briefly the history of the Inca Empire and the fact that many ancient societies were often built on social hierarchies and categories. Um, and this makes her wonder if categories are really exclusively Western and European. Um, can you speak a little bit more about this? Do you have? Yeah, sure. Yeah, go definitely. Ahead. That's that's actually a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that they're not. And I agree with what um, I think Trang was the name you mentioned uh, was was saying that, of course, there are uh, they're talking about ancient societies built on social hierarchies and older uh, ancient categories. Um, and absolutely, that does mean. And of course, I agree that there is no category or categories are not exclusively Western and European, but it's a reality of scholarship that when we think about especially genres and this type of categorizations, we do use categories that are framed within the, let's call it global north or Europe or the Western world. Uh, in specifically thinking about the Gothic, that's clearly a category that is deeply Eurocentric in the sense that has been, uh, that uh, has originated in Europe and that has a tradition that is clearly European. So that it becomes problematic with that kind of tradition and terminology and category is then kind of applied to texts that are written and created in areas of the world and by people that do not describe within those uh, that system. So I think that um, 
I think it's really interesting. And I think that in my understanding of these categories, and especially of the Gothic, um, I'm not interested in the Gothic as this set of props or this explanatory label, uh, but rather in the Gothic used as a tool. So uh, in the Gothic understood as this sort of discursive formation that writers, especially indigenous writers, post-colonial indigenous writers engage with in acts as creative resistance. So not writing within the genre, but like writing um, using that tool, having that genre in mind and doing something interesting with that. So um, the problem is when critics then read that and just apply uh, the Eurocentric category to explain it because it's a text that is so uh, not different from, but necessarily writing it from a different point of view compared to European or Western or Global North texts, uh, that then, of course, it becomes difficult to kind of, or challenging to make sense of it. And that's when it becomes problematic, when when critics apply this, this Western Eurocentric categories to texts that are doing exactly that. So exactly the problematizing of those categories, I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. A brilliant answer. Yeah. Um, so I have a question for Rachel um, from Valentina. Um, Valentina says, firstly, thank you very much for an inspiring presentation and for bringing to the foreground literature's potential for change and nuance to make space for both connections and disconnections. Um, she's fascinated by the notion of um, ethics of connection, which I understand is a borrowed term, um, but I'd like to hear more about how you envision it. Thank you. That's a really good question. I'm glad that you enjoyed the paper. Um, so ethics of connection or this this terminology of an ethics of connection is, uh, comes from Ivan Kalu's paper on um, their papers specifically talking about the virus and um, the COVID virus and how the so the instalment of summer is, is kind of responding to the pandemic. Um, and the paper is very much about in the context of the pandemic, how we all found different ways to connect with one another, kind of like, like on the street with our neighbours, on, on social media, um, kind of both locally and globally. And um, they, they kind of read how summer taps into that kind of that ethic of connection about how in a moment of, of global crisis, um, you know, there were many divisions and, and, and kind of tensions, but there were also moments of kind of connection. And it's about it's about celebrating those moments of connection and about finding something restorative or or something hopeful in that moment of connection. Um, and I think that's where the, this idea of ethic comes from, about kind of wanting to aspire to something, even if it's not perfect, even if we can't kind of fully craft it into words. Um, at least for me, that's kind of how I think about it. Um, and I think how, how I want to look at about, how, sorry, how I want to look at the ethic of connection as it appears across the quartet as a whole is to think about how these novels create shared spaces for their for its characters. Um, if you've read the quartet, there are many characters from, from different places um, across the UK, from different kind of social stratospheres. And it's about how they meet one another, um, sometimes in person, sometimes with letters, sometimes through like kind of news commentary, um, or or sometimes through that kind of almost that six degrees of separation so it's it's about all those tiny little moments of connection that you can find in like the mundane kind of course of life and I think the novels very much celebrate that connection the connection that is small but just as important as all the big stuff mm -hmm. um so that's kind of the root of where I take that that thinking and that process yeah, super interesting. Thank you. Um, that's great. Um, so I have a question from Marie from Danny. Um, she asks, um, do you think the YA genre opens up new paradigms for Indigenous writing? Yes, I think so. Um, it seems, um, you know, Patricia Grace, Patricia Grace is a Maori author, um, and uh, she recently wrote an, um, an autobiography and in it, she mentions the fact that when she grew up, she she never saw herself in books and that everything that was related to, um, you know, um, colors that were not white uh, meant um, something evil and that she uh, grew up associating herself with, um, you know, everything that was wrong in uh, New Zealand uh, society. And so uh, her work uh, 
um, as a writer has been to uh, decolonize um, Aotearoa New Zealand literature. And she was one of the first authors to publish for children. And um, so basically what she she wants what she wanted and still wants it was to um, offer the um, Maori children the possibility to uh, identify with characters and stories um, that um, and she, that developed um, migrant literature as well. So you do have now um, authors from other minorities who uh, can also publish in uh, Aotearoa New Zealand. So yes, I think that it, um, the, the YA genre can definitely um, improve um, the, you know, the, the situation for teenagers, um, and especially when it comes to their mental health. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That was something that definitely came through from your paper as well, that kind of question of mental health and, you know, reading as a process of understanding and, you know, yes. that was really, yeah, really good. Um, so I have a question from Margaret, um, which is for Carolina. Um, she says she appreciates your focus on destabilising Western schemes of interpretation as a necessary aspect of receiving Indigenous writing. Have you encountered distinctly decolonial frameworks of literary critique rather than just a broad decolonial approach? Um, that we may turn to in the first instance of review? Thank you for this question. I think it's really interesting. Um, I don't think I have encountered anything like that uh, when it comes to this text specifically. Uh, I have been looking at several other texts and I think that it's still there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, and I think it, it's mostly up to us not to kind of fall back into using these categories carelessly, because I don't think that these categories are useless. I think that categories and genres are necessary because they're kind they work they work as containers for discussions and for thinking about these things. Without these labels, we would not be thinking about them. So it's necessary to address this kind of conversation. Uh, but I think that it's problematic when it becomes a way to explain a text that clearly doesn't want to be explained. Uh, when ex to explain a text, to make sense of a text that is deliberately ambiguous. Um, and I think that we should kind of understand that ambiguity as one of the, the main accomplishments of this text um, and kind of use it and understand it and capitalize on that rather than on trying to make sense of it and you know, explaining it. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of work to do, but I think that the work should start from that, from using this, um, this genre labels as tools to think about what they entail, to think about what they mean and to think about why they have so much currency. Absolutely. Yeah, that kind of idea that friction and tension and ambiguity are really significant here. Yeah, definitely. Um, OK, so next question is from um, Trang and it's for Rachel. Um, she says, you mentioned that narrative is collaborative. Um, could you talk a little bit more about this? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think in the context that I'm talking about it in this paper, I, I think it's specifically when I'm talking about the exchanging of letters and about this kind of collaborative moment of exchange, of the exchanging of stories. Um, and, and perhaps to link it, there was another question in the chat, so maybe I can answer both at the same time, which was about this quotation of the shape, the shape the telling takes, and then in, as a kind of counterpart to this, the shape the listening takes. And I think this, again, is that moment of collaboration, of, of like, of telling the story, of communicating the story is about about exchange, about about someone receiving it on the other end and generating feelings and emotions and opinions about that. And I think it's in that moment of collaboration when you're not just speaking to avoid, but speaking to other people um, that you can kind of create moments of connection. Um, there was something that um, Akhtar Bra talked about in their keynote, which was about, um, I've lost the notes about it, but it was it was something about how we enter into kind of productive dialogue and critical discussion. They don't always have to agree with one another, but to be productively in conversation with one another. And I think when I talk about narrative as collaborative, it's about talking about how we are in this shared space with these shared experiences, but we all experience them in different ways. And it's about how we tell each other those experiences and how we listen and respond and respect those people's experiences that are separate from our own. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of where I'm coming to with that 
Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that completely. Like it's, you know, writing and reading involves, you know, the, the coming together, doesn't it? Like you can't really have one without without the other. I think that's really, really important. Definitely. Um, so I have another question for Maureen from Valentina. Um, I'm just checking. I haven't already. No, I haven't already asked you this question. Um, so she says, um, thank you for an interesting presentation. Um, in Canada, many Indigenous authors are concerned that their work may be recolonized by publishers and editors. So they often keep their works hidden. But those who do publish say that it is empowering for encouraging future generations to be fearless and proud. Um, can you talk a little bit about this, uh, a little bit more about this in the context of New Zealand? Yes. Well, thank you for, for the question. Um, it seems that, um, well, Carolina will, will perhaps um, give her opinion on it as well, but it seems that um, in Australia, um, Aboriginal stories, especially linked to the dreaming, are more kept uh, secret than uh, the, um, the stories that uh, belong to Maori um, because of the, the history um, in New Zealand. Um, it seems that um, stories have been uh, plundered and um, appropriated by the Pakeha settlers very early. And um, so I guess that um, stories are still there uh, in the sense that oral literature is extremely uh, vibrant and um, also um, in the publishing market. But um, what is now uh, the trend seems to be to uh, go beyond those stories, even if some uh, conservative Maori disagree with, uh, for example, a science fiction uh, with Maori characters by a Maori author. Um, I'm taking the example of Steph Matuku in uh, Flight of the Fantail where she was quite criticized um, for uh, imagining, um, you know, science fiction setting in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And um, sh she and other authors like Fiti Ereaka took her defense saying that Maori can do anything and they should not be trapped in uh, pre-colonial stories. And that there's been uh, a another story since then and that should be taken into account and when it comes to YA fiction it seems that yes it makes uh, teenagers stronger and um, you know more resilient if they can see themselves in books absolutely yeah yeah brilliant thank you um <coughs> sorry um that actually leads me into another question and let me just find it because um things that you were just saying really resonated with this question it's actually for carolina um from valentina says um thank you so much for your presentation um do you find the categories post-colonial and supernatural problematic and insufficient um when discussing indigenous texts with regards to the latter Indigenous intellectuals often suggest that these divisions do not originate in Indigenous epistemologies, defying the concept of supernatural as Europeans understand it to indicate something that is not real. Have you considered how Indigenous critics read this text and what does Alexis Wright say about her text and these categories? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Valentina. This is a great question and I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed, you enjoyed the presentation. Um, it kind of links back to everything we've said so far, I think. Um, but first of all, to address really this question, um, there's not a lot of Indigenous critics that have looked at this text and written about it. Uh, but what Alexis Wright is really, I think, adamant in doing all the time is um, what I said earlier, so to keep this text ambiguous, to refraining from offering comforting explanations, comforting resolutions to this text. And I think that, um, in answering the other part of the question, whether or not the categories of post-colonial and supernatural are problematic and insufficient, I wouldn't say insufficient is the right word. I would probably though say that they have to be handled with care, knowing exactly what we're using, what kind of background those words have and what meaning they have in the context in which we use them. Because I'm aware that, for example, my reading of Planes of Promise could have 
could run the risk of being perceived as, you know, like the reading of a text alienating non-Indigenous readership and plunging them into anotherness that is uh, that cannot be overlooked and that cannot be explained. And this, of course, could fall into the, the simplistic binary white reader versus black text. Um, but I think we have to keep in mind that in general, post-colonial writing inevitably deals with the existence of at least two different worldviews that come into contact at some time. Um, and I think that assuming that those worldviews should necessarily be mutually intelligible is also quite simplistic and runs another risk, the risk of reading indigenous texts, of reading claims of promise and other indigenous texts with the expectations or even the demand of gaining insider knowledge, you know, or otherwise undisclosed insights into uh, Indigenous experience, Aboriginal experience, which essentially means reading a work of fiction as a work of salvaging ethnography. Um, that betrays the, the Western reader's controversial demand and desire for authentic Indigenous content or even authentically Indigenous content, which essentially, again, um, sees the texts as indigenous texts as engaging with Aboriginal life rather than with interpretations and representations of Aboriginal life uh, that expose, which exposes another clear double standard, I think, that when we are dealing with a Western work, we would be valuing it for its critical engagement with the representational systems. But when we look at an exotic indigenous work, then we value it according to its insights into indigenous life. So I think that, yeah, this is a very, very broad take on these questions. But to answer also what uh, Marine was saying earlier about uh, silences and appropriation of stories, I think that this is key in every Indigenous context. It's true in, in New Zealand, definitely in Australia, but also in Canada, as Valentina was mentioning earlier. Um, and I think that this links back to the early origins of uh, colonization of settler colonialism, because we're talking about settler invader nations where we have settler colonialism and the need, I think, to go back to uh, stories to uh, create a sort of national authenticity for a national consolidating ends, in a sense. And usually the Gothic was used there to, to kind of create a haunting to make the land homely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. So many important points brought up there, I feel. Um, yeah, questioning, you know, when we look, when we take decolonial and postcolonial critique, you know, we have to make sure that we're not going too far the other way and saying, well, yeah. now we're pigeon pigeonholing and we're saying, <clears throat> you know, certain writers must talk about certain um, cultures or themes or circumstances um, that we wouldn't necessarily place on other writers. So, um, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so I have, I think this will be the last question and it's a good one to end on because it's for Rachel, um, but the um, questioner, question E person, um, says that she also interested in to hear others, um, all of your views on it as well. Um, so Margaret asks, um, uh, Rachel, you directed us to Smith's quote, um, there are always ways to survive. Oh, no, you've already answered this one, haven't you, actually, I think, um, with the shape of the, the telling techniques. Well, we can we can talk about it more and maybe more. hear what Caroline yeah. and Marine think about it. OK, awesome. Like. Um, that's great. All right. Let me um, say so directed us to Smith's quote. There are always um, ways to survive these times. And I think one way is the shape the telling takes, which I felt really spoke to this panel. Um, though I think we can add the shape um, the listening takes as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what listening as a decolonizing practice might look like. So I think I just took the quotation as my way of thinking about that question about collaboration, but I think we can, yeah. I didn't speak to it in the context of decolonizing practice, and I think we could maybe speak more on that, and it might be a nice way to yeah, absolutely. kind of have a collaborative conversation. Um, I mean, for me to think about, I feel like my paper touches less on this context of decolonization, um, perhaps because I'm thinking more about, I suppose, neo-colonial contexts, contexts that are kind of related to the the rhetoric we're using and the kind of like the less visible borders that we are creating in our kind of um society um and kind of nadine el nani talks about how britain is a domestic colonial space and i think that's a really useful way to think about how colonialism is something that doesn't just happen elsewhere but it's something that happens here and so talking about decoloniality and talking about where these stories are being told and where they're being listened kind of you know kind of the different spaces in which we are sharing these stories um 
we need we need to remember to look not just afar but locally to kind of think about what other borders we are creating amongst ourselves um and i think listening if we're thinking about the sheep the listening takes listening is about reminding ourselves that we're not just listening like in the comfort of our own rooms like on our sofa like you know retweeting an image or kind of watching something on the news there's there's a kind of geographical distance will only do so much work we've kind of got to think about how it affects us individually kind of in our day-to-day lives and that's what Ali Smith is trying to do in her work a little bit so trying to remind us that it's not just something you can kind of hit retweet and and, and kind of ignore it's something that's happening around us yeah absolutely yeah definitely it feels really important does anybody else have anything to add to that I think that um, this is really interesting. I think it's really important also in, th- in thinking about the decolonizing practice of listening um, and in linking it back to what we were talking about earlier, the appropriation of indigenous stories and of indigenous voices and how often the stories have been silenced throughout history. I think that it's really important to listen to uh, also the silences within narratives uh, because often it happens that, and I'm thinking specifically about a, a novel by um, an Indigenous writer in Canada, um, the novel is uh, Monkey Beach by Eden Robinson, that is structured very much along what is said and what is not said. And often what is not said is this connection to the colonial past that you as a reader have to kind of fill in for the, the narrative voice that does not explain, that does not say. So I think that it's really important to do that too, to do that kind of work of like listening to the silences, actively listening to what is not being said, because it's often as important as what is said in the narrative and really thinking about how forgetting and remembering are not, um, you know, like neutral processes, but there's always a reason why some stories are said, some, some stories are told, and some stories are silenced, and some parts of them are told and or not. And again, this links back to necessarily the Gothic because of the repression and of you know the trauma and how difficult it is sometimes to to speak. Absolutely, yeah, I completely agree with that. The silence is is so important in the text, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Marie, I I definitely agree with you on this. Uh, it reminds me of um, a quotation from Baby No Eyes by Patricia Grace, where um, she the grandmother says, "Our oh, stories could kill you," and so she she has um, kept the, the the stories of her families for herself for for decades. And um, because she's pressed, um, you know, to she is um, she has no other choice but to tell the story. Um, then her her son, her grandson, oh uh, yeah, and um, and and the baby uh, that he that his wife was about to have uh, die in an accident, and um, and so she she feels guilty afterwards for having told the stories. Um, at a, a, a moment when she should not have, because stories um, need a certain ritual and they need uh, the proper listener for it. And at that time, um, her family was not ready uh, to listen to her. And um, so, yes, there is great responsibility when telling a story and when listening to one. And so I guess that's um, it's also part of our role as uh, researchers in uh, indigenous literature uh, to not recolonize, and you know, the text by applying uh, Eurocentric uh, views and methodologies onto the text that we study. So, yeah, mm, brilliant. Yeah, some absolutely amazing things to think about there as well as we move forward as well. Um, so we are going to have to stop there as we're coming up to time. Um, I could sit and talk about this for hours, though, but I can't, unfortunately. Um, so I just want to take a moment to thank you all for being here today and for taking part in the conference. Um, it's been really great listening to your papers and speaking to you. Um, as this is the last panel of the... Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, as this is the last panel of the conference, um, I also just want to take a moment before we all sign off um, to give thanks on behalf of the organisational team and myself and um, to all panellists and attendees. Um, thank you for your fascinating presentation presentations and thoughtful questions throughout the week. Um, we'd also like to thank Josh at the Bonington Gallery and for all of his hard work leading conferences and this week. Um, the Post-Colonial Studies Centre couldn't have done this without you. You're amazing and we are extremely grateful. 
Um, I'd also like to thank the rest of the team. So Alan, Danny, Margaret, Perna, Trang and Valentina. Well done, everyone. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank uh, Jenny Ramone and Nicole Tiara at the Postcolonial Studies Centre, um, as well as the centre itself, for bringing us together and providing a space for the initial building of bridges which led to this conference. Um, so thank you very much. Goodbye.